APSF believes that increased awareness and understanding of risk factors associated with perioperative visual loss, or POVL, is an important and current patient safety topic. The following informed consent process simulations reflect the conclusions and recommendations of the APSF-sponsored conference on perioperative visual loss and emphasize the importance of including POVL caused by ischemic optic neuropathy in the informed consent process for at-risk patients. Ideally, this risk is presented and discussed by the surgeon in the days before the surgery. In this regard, the anesthesiologist may share information to help the surgeon appreciate the importance of including blindness in the informed consent process for at-risk patients. If POVL is not part of the informed consent process at this time, APSF believes it must be part of the anesthesia consent obtained by the anesthesiologist most often near the time of surgery. Dr. Kimmel, I'll be the anesthesiologist for Mr. Coleman, your patient who's scheduled for spinal fusion surgery next week. Since I've not worked with you before, I wanted to ask your opinion about discussing the risk of blindness while obtaining informed patient consent for surgery and anesthesia for a spinal fusion surgery in the prone position. Well, Dr. Stevens, it's interesting you should mention that. I was at a meeting recently when blindness after spine surgery was discussed. And I understand there's information in the anesthesia literature regarding some possible risk factors for this complication. I've done more than 100 of these surgeries. None of my patients have ever experienced blindness. So right now, I'm not inclined to mention blindness when obtaining informed consent. I think mentioning such a rare complication would only serve to unnecessarily frighten patients and their families. I understand what you're saying, but I'm also worried about the devastating impact of this unpredictable complication. Even though it's rare, I think it's so catastrophic that it should be part of the informed consent process for surgery and anesthesia. Most patients are probably going to want to know about this complication as they weigh the risks and the benefits of having spine surgery. I recently read a consensus report from a, a multidisciplinary conference based on postoperative blindness sponsored by the APSF the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation. And the consensus was that blindness should be included as part of the informed consent process for at-risk patients. And that ideally, the surgeon would discuss this with the patient prior to the day of surgery. The report also recommended that if blindness was not part of surgical consent, that the anesthesiologist should discuss this with the patient. Since the anesthesiologist usually meets the patient the morning of surgery, this clearly is not the best time for the patient to first hear of such an important complication, no matter how infrequent. Another part of the consensus report that really grabbed my attention was the extreme value that patients place on their vision. In fact, in a recent study by the Mayo Clinic, 80% of spinal fusion surgery patients would prefer a full face-to-face -face disclosure by their surgeon prior to the day of surgery. I agree that the morning of surgery is not the time for the patient to first learn of this risk. Although I'm not convinced that this rare and frightening complication should be presented to the patient, I understand your position and I will include blindness as one of the risks associated with this surgery. Since I have not discussed blindness as part of the informed consent process with patients in the past, I would appreciate any suggestions you can share. Excellent. I can give you anesthesia literature as well as conclusions and recommendations from the APSF consensus conference that I mentioned. Briefly, here are a few of the highlights. Now there are a number of factors that affect the risk of blindness. We can't control all of these factors such as male gender or obesity, but we can keep them in mind when forming our surgical and anesthetic plan. There are a number of factors, however, that we can control such as the length of surgery, the amount of time that the patient's head is in a steep head down position, blood loss, the patient's blood pressure, as well as the selection of fluids for volume replacement. This means we can work together to minimize the degree of head down position. Frames that keep the head relatively neutral and level with the heart reduce the risk of blindness. 
Other frames, however, such as the Wilson frame, which keep the head at a much lower position than the heart, increase the risk of blindness. I'll pay special attention to volume replacement, especially the balance of crystalloid to colloid, with a goal to decrease the transfused volume of crystalloid. Blood loss is something that's hard to control, but we can consider it and discuss it as surgery progresses, as well as the length of surgery and the potential of considering a staged approach. Here's an idea. How about having me join you a few times when you meet with patients that are scheduled for spinal surgery? Perhaps our office administrators can find a time that would work well for both of us. If this won't work for you, then you can assure your patients that I'm familiar with the complication and that I will take all the steps possible to reduce the chances of this risk. You can also let them know that I will bring this up when they meet with me on the morning of surgery. I agree that the best patient care is a team approach. Although I'm concerned that mentioning blindness will evoke unfounded fear and hesitancy to undergo the indicated surgery, I will mention it when I obtain the informed consent in my office a week before the surgery. Mr. Coleman, your spinal fusion surgery is scheduled for next week. We're meeting at this time to discuss your understanding of the planned surgery, its benefits and risks. After our discussion, I will ask you to give your informed consent to proceed with the surgery and anesthesia. So, we have now discussed the surgical and anesthesia plan as well as the benefits of proceeding. Do you have any questions about the plan before I move on to the risks? No, it's pretty clear. In general terms, the risks of your surgery include nerve injury, paralysis, stroke, and death. There are also possible risks associated with blood transfusion and with post-operative pain. Now I will go over these risks in as much detail as you'd like. So there's a risk of dying from this surgery? Although death is always a possible complication with surgery and anesthesia, it's such a rare occurrence that I usually don't go into a lot of detail about it unless you ask. But given your general good health, the risk of dying from the surgery or the anesthetic is very small. Now while we are discussing rare complications, I need to also make you aware of a very rare but important complication that has been associated with the type of spine surgery that we're discussing. Blindness is a remote and unpredictable risk of this surgery. Because we all highly value our ability to see, I need to be confident that you understand this risk when you give your informed consent. Wow. You mean I could become permanently and totally blind? How could blindness be a risk from surgery on my back? As surprising as it sounds, blindness is a rare risk. It's so rare that we really don't have a good way to explain why it occurs. For that same reason, there's no surefire method of preventing it, and if it occurs, well, there's no effective treatment for it. Because of the rarity and unpredictability of this complication, it's hard for me to give you a feel of the incidence of blindness, but it is estimated to occur in about one out of every 1,000 spinal fusions. Now, I need to reassure you that your anesthesiologist and I are familiar with the most up-to-date information and recommendations regarding this complication, and there are things we can do while caring for you to help reduce this risk. These strategies include the way we position your head and body, and as well as how we manage your blood pressure and your need for fluids and blood during the operation. Your anesthesiologist and I will make every effort to safely position your body during the operation, and I will do my best to minimize blood loss. And I will also make every effort to limit the length of time it takes to safely complete your surgery. Now, if we feel like your surgery is taking longer than expected, or you're losing more blood than we anticipated and we become concerned for your safety, we may stop the surgery and come back at a later time to complete your spinal fusion. Your anesthesiologist and I will make use of these strategies during your surgery. Now, it's not a guarantee, but we want to take precautions that we feel are reasonable and safe. I am truly shocked that blindness is a risk of this surgery. It's upsetting to think about that possibility, but uh... My family and I have thought a great deal about my condition and the available options. 
I want to talk with my wife about what you told me, but at this point, I still want to proceed. Thanks for telling me, and if I change my mind, I will let you know. I understand, and I will be more than happy to answer any questions that you or your wife have after discussing what we've talked about today. Assuming that you do want to proceed with the surgery, your anesthesiologist will ask your understanding of this risk when you meet her the morning of surgery. Good morning, Mr. Coleman. My name is Dr. Stevens. I'll be your anesthesiologist for your spinal fusion surgery. Um, I've reviewed your medical records, and in a moment, I will perform a brief physical exam. So we've talked about the planned anesthesia and any possible common side effects. Do you have any questions? Uh, no. Thank you for your thorough explanation. For someone healthy like you undergoing this type of surgery, the risks of serious or life-threatening complications associated with your anesthesia are very low, but do include death or brain damage. I also wanted to review with you the recent conversation you had with your surgeon, Dr. Kimmel, about the risks of your surgery. Specifically, I want to make sure that in giving informed consent for surgery and anesthesia, you understand that blindness is a rare risk of the operation you will undergo. Yes, I understand that blindness is a rare risk of this surgery. I also understand that you and my surgeon are familiar with this risk and will take precautions to make sure that I'm as safe as possible. I'm worried about losing my sight, but I feel that you and my surgeon have provided me with the information necessary for me to give my informed consent for the anesthesia and surgery. Would you like to speak with Dr. Kimmel before you go to sleep? No, but I look forward to seeing you both when I wake up. Dr. Kimmel, I'll be the anesthesiologist for Mr. Coleman. You're a patient who's scheduled for spinal fusion surgery next week. Since I've not worked with you before, I wanted to ask your opinion about discussing the risk of blindness while obtaining informed patient consent for surgery and anesthesia for a spinal fusion surgery in the prone position. I agree that the morning of surgery is not the time for the patient to first learn of this rare risk. I appreciate your concern but I do not think that mentioning blindness in the informed consent is in the patient's best interest. I think mentioning such a rare complication will only serve to unnecessarily frighten the patient and his family and possibly deter him from proceeding with the indicated surgery to address his chronic back pain. I appreciate your candor. I do want to let you know that I will include blindness in my informed consent for anesthesia. Without including the risk of blindness, I do not believe I am providing an adequate explanation of risks. Failure to include this complication could place us both at significant risk for liability if blindness were to occur. I appreciate that the patient will probably be upset to hear about such a catastrophic complication moments before going into scheduled surgery, but I assure you that I will let the patient know that both of us are familiar with recommendations and practices that may lessen the chances of this risk. I do hope we can continue our conversation in the future and hopefully come to some agreement that we're both comfortable with. Well, I can't say I'm pleased about this. I'm asking you again to consider the negative impact you're mentioning the remote risk of blindness will have on a patient a few minutes before surgery. I hear you. I will make every effort to be reassuring. I will explain to our patient what we know and will do to keep him safe during anesthesia and surgery. I will mention to him that we can call you to speak to him once more before he goes to sleep. If he wants to talk to you, can I give you a call? Yes, I'll be happy to speak with him. Good morning, Mr. Coleman. My name is Dr. Stevens. I'll be your anesthesiologist for your spinal fusion surgery. Um, I've reviewed your medical records, and in a moment, I will perform a brief physical exam. Lastly, I want to review with you the recent discussion you had with your surgeon, Dr. Kimmel, about the risks of your surgery. Specifically, I want to ask you if Dr. Kimmel mentioned blindness as one of the rare complications of the operation you'll be undergoing. What? 
blindness from back surgery. No, Dr. Kimmel didn't mention that. How is it possible to become blind after back surgery? I understand it's upsetting to hear about such a risk just before going to sleep, but I believe that it's an important complication, and even though it's extremely rare, you need to be made aware of the remote possibility. The rarity and unpredictability of this complication make it difficult for me to give you a feel for the incidence of blindness, but it has been estimated to occur in about one of every 1,000 spinal fusions. Dr. Kimmel and I are up to date with the most recent recommendations and information regarding this risk. And there are things that we can do while caring for you to reduce the chances of this complication, such as how we position your head and body, um, how we manage your blood pressure and your needs for fluid and blood during your surgery. If your surgery takes longer than we anticipated, or you begin to lose more blood than we expected and we become concerned for your safety, we may stop the surgery and come back at a later time and finish your spinal fusion. Your surgeon and I will use these strategies during your surgery. It's not a guarantee, but we want to take precautions that we think are reasonable and safe. I'm still upset. I, I wish I had known about this earlier, like when I met last week with Dr. Kimmel. It's really hard for me to decide what I should do right now. What would you do if you were me? Maybe we should call Dr. Kimmel to come into the operating room and speak with you more about the benefits of your surgery in light of the risks of this complication. I mentioned to him that we may want to speak with him once more and he said he would be pleased to come by. This is a discussion that I think we all should have together. Complimentary copies of this DVD and the companion DVD of the summary of the proceedings of the APSF-sponsored POVL conference may be requested on the APSF website, www.apsf.org.